So this is essentially part of a, a line of programs that are generally called WISE interventions. And the reason why they're called WISE is not because there's some WISE researcher telling students what to think or what to do, but instead it has more to do with the process through which these interventions are informed. So rather than just relying based on theory um, or based purely on data, it is this hybrid model of trying to understand what it is that students are contending with um, in terms of psychological barriers and then creating an intervention that specifically targets those, those barriers. Um, it is a long process that we've been engaged with, which began with looking at historical data, uh, looking at any existing surveys uh, and reports that have been done in terms of student success and underperforming groups of students here, here at SFC. Uh, doing pr uh, surveys with students that particularly ask about a number of uh, anticipated domains of, uh, of psychology that we thought students might be contending with here and then having uh, in-depth, in-focus uh, focus groups in person with the students uh, on campus on two occasions to again sort of hash out the more in more detail what their experience is like in terms of the, the, the domains that we identified through the surveys and, and the historical data analysis. So essentially we did a lot of work to understand what issues the students are struggling with, which groups are struggling with them, and then how we can sort of translate that into messaging that resonates best with the students. Um, we know that Based on our work uh, with the students, we identified a few domains that we uh, might have anticipated, but a few that we, we found were not validated. So uh, many, many students across different campuses contend with a, a, a range of issues um, in terms of our, their uncertainties about what it means to be a, a student in college. One of which is this just this general feeling like, like that you don't belong, that your teachers are not validating your sense of worth and, uh, and uh, potential. Um, your peers are a little bit harsh. The, the social networks are quite clearly defined and you feel like you're not fitting in. So students talk, come in and say, you know, I just feel like I don't belong. Um, so we, we came in sort of asking about their, their sense of belonging on campus uh, in this institution. And in general, we found that that was not validated. In general, we did not find that students contended uh, sort of at a disproportionate rate with these issues of not belonging because it turns out that their faculty are very responsive, they're very involved, they're engaged, their peers are understanding, they understand that their peers are like them, they're human, that they struggle with a lot of issues that from time to time they have their own uncertainties and anxieties. Um, and so that was one of the things that was disconfirmed. And so we steered away from that and then we began looking at some of the other domains um, that might have been an issue. And the themes that came up were uh, some of the following. So students talked about feeling like they were afraid to fail. Like this was their chance to demonstrate um, to their parents and their families uh, that they can make it on their own for the first time, that they can really make something out of themselves, that society is looking to see how they do here to essentially determine wh where they'll end up in the future. Um, but there's also this sort of sense of lack of clarity. So they, they had been either given little guidance in terms of what it is that they should be focusing on here at school and at college, or how to, how to go about um, accomplishing or engaging in that journey with a particular major or a particular set of courses. So a lot of students talked about not really being clear about what their majors should be um, and how to go about deciding what that major should be. So those are two distinct things, I should say. You may not know what you, what you want to do, but you may also not know how to go about finding out what you, what you want to do. Um, and both of those themes actually emerged in our conversations. Um, the, the one thing that, that struck me, at least, as being something that stood out from some of the conversations we've had with students in other campuses is that while students here recognize the utility of external resources, like they realize that if you don't understand something that you go to tutoring services and you uh, sort of take their time, understand how to navigate through some, some barriers or some, some questions that you might have, and that ultimately you'll, you'll end up with an outcome that's better than, than previous. If you want to go to mental health services, that's available. That if you want to uh, do time management, for instance, that's, that's, that's available. If you want to go see your professors, that's always available. So they recognized 
the existence and the utility of all these external sources of resources, but they were almost blind to the internal sources of resources. And that, and that means a recognition of uh, how their own emotions play out in terms of their engagement and their motivation. So um, a lot of them have said, you know, I generally don't feel like studying. And they were quite surprised that that's a normal thing and that, that that's okay. But that's something that you want to work with. That simply not feeling like you, you want to study doesn't mean that it's the basis for not studying. Um, because if you understand that most people don't want to study, and most people you know, actually don't feel good learning and sort of stretching themselves, um, then that's something you can now engage in. So this general sort of sense of self-awareness uh, and self-monitoring was not there to the degree that we would have expected uh, or hoped for. Um, and that's one of the things that students talked about. When we, when we sort of framed the conversation in terms of, you know, so recognizing these external resources, what are some of the internal resources that you can utilize? Um, there was this sort of quiet silence that fell over, uh, yeah, crickets. Uh, but also this epiphany, uh, as though they had just come across or stumbled across an insight that could really impact them. That if they realize that they can manage their time based on their emotions, that they could manage their thoughts, that they could manage their narratives and their interpretations when they're trying to make meaning of what that D means or when they're trying to make sense of what that not being invited to a party means, then, then maybe you can take greater ownership. And there was a, a powerful moment in the room when we talked about that. And then there was also just this general sort of limited understanding of how their past experiences, especially those coming from relatively challenged backgrounds, um, can transfer and be related to their studying skills and their academic skills. So we see this a lot in athletics. You know, student athletes tend to be bogged down with a couple of negative stereotypes. One, they tend to generally be, tend to be my, um, racial minorities. Uh, and the other is that they have this negative uh, stereotype of being a dumb jock. Uh, so when they come into academics, they feel like, you know, I really don't fit in here because I'm a minority and I'm a dumb jock. But then when you tell them that the, the same skills that they learn through their athletics training, which re requires self-sacrifice, discipline, teamwork, uh, effort, uh, that these are the core skills that essentially defines a good student. And there's, again, this moment where like, oh, okay, actually maybe I can be a good student. Maybe do, I do have the prerequisite skills. Those coming from... Um, lower SES uh, backgrounds re realize that they have the resilience and the grit to endure things like getting a bad grade or having to study for, for a particular test. So once they realize that, that the sources of, of difficulty in one domain can actually be transferred as a source of strength in another domain, uh, then that was a potentially powerful um, intervenable insight as well. So. Based, and, and I wish that we could sort of individually target each of the vulnerabilities that, that we've highlighted there, uh, but based on the expectations uh, set out in the grant application and all of the insights that we gained from the student surveys and some theory, we've essentially come up with a hybrid uh, intervention that marries two existing lines of research called the values affirmation. So in my earlier presentation where I showed the, the global sense of self-integrity where you, where you remind people of aspects of their cells that are not related to the threatened domain, that that sort of bolsters their self-view uh, against threat, that's one thing that we're going to be doing in combination with setting goals. So now there's actually really exciting research showing that simply asking people to think about their goals tends to activate this threat response. Because on some level, they either don't believe that they can do it, or it's threatening that someone else has to tell them to do it. So if you can create a framing in which they are first affirmed and buffered against stress, and then allowed to think about their own goals in a way that they can take ownership, then we're hoping that that will give them the sense of clarity about what they want to do and how to get there uh, in a way that, that minimizes their experiences of threat. Uh, so that's really sort of the active treatment condition. Uh, and then we need a control condition. And for this study, because um, we also want to see whether growth mindset has an impact. So growth mindset, uh, which most of you are, might be familiar, familiar with, is born out of Carol Dweck's work showing that people have one of two beliefs about intelligence and ability. That either it's this fixed uh, trait that some people have more or less of, or it's this uh, quality or skill that you can acquire through greater effort and the, the usage of, of effective strategies. So if you think that you can become smarter, 
then maybe when you get that bad grade, it doesn't become a reflection that you are clearly labeled as a dumb person. That becoming smarter means getting bad grades. It means going through difficult content from time to time. So we're, we're using these two as the sort of the two active treatment conditions. And then we're comparing uh, both of these to an, 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 an inert control condition. So there are three conditions that students will be randomly assigned to so that we can infer which of these conditions uh, is most impactful. So what does that mean uh, in terms of your experience? Well, the activity will be entirely online. Um, in fact, we have a, a URL that, that Lee and, and Kina will, will be distributing. Um, so in the next few days, you'll be getting an email with this link. Um, once students cl uh, click on the link, then essentially at that point, they will be navigated to the, to the study. Uh, they'll also be randomly assigned to one of the three conditions that I've mentioned. Um, and there'll be some, some post-intervention uh, post measures. As I mentioned, there's some uh, psychological questions, there's the intervention, and then um, what we do is to try to internalize the message as opposed to telling them that this is what they should believe uh, or, or how they should think about things, we ask them to engage in this writing ac activity called the saying is believing exercise where they're given an opportunity for themselves to explore and reflect on why these things are important to them. So the values affirmation essentially gets them to think about the values that are important to them and then tell us why those values are important to them. Um, and so that's, that's essentially the general layout. Um, the, the, the activity is entirely self-contained and self-paced and will take about 35 to 45 minutes. Is that something that seems feasible in terms of time? And anyone feel like that might not be? Because we, we would need to know if that feels too long or too short so that we can make adjustments at this point. So they will do this in the classroom? No. Or they will do this at home? Ideally in the classroom, if okay. we have access to computers. Okay. You're going to come to my uh, No, so when you select your day, I will put you a room. It will be a computer class. Okay. Class or somewhere. Okay. Uh, Ms. Smith is actually going to rehearse today. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, great. So it's all ready to go. Okay. Yeah, yes. So if we have computer facilities in our regular classroom, can we do a better study than one? Yes, of course. We do. We do. We have a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so as long as we can sort of ensure that students are focused on this content and not, you know, surfing the web, um, then that's great. Um, and having this, this standardized, uh, <coughs> you know, session where everybody's doing it at the same time, uh, it works out really well. So implementation instructions. Um, as you're talking to students about this, this activity, um, we need to be mindful of how to frame it. There's a lot of research showing that if you tell someone that they're going to do something that will benefit them, it ends up not benefiting them. Because now they expect, they expect the outcome as opposed to reflecting on the experience. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to say that uh, this intervention is intended to help them for, no, for two reasons. One is that, again, they're focused on what it's supposed to do. And the other is they ask themselves, well, why are you trying to help me? Right? So then the questions are like, do I need help? Am I in need of help? Which, again, is counter to some of the experiences that we're trying to articulate here. Um, so you don't want to say that this is intended to help, help you. You also don't want to mention anything about underperforming groups. So you don't want to say that the low SES, first gen racial minorities tend to be the ones that benefit the most from these kinds of interventions. Again, for many of the same reasons. You don't want to activate a deficit model because when you put, put people in that frame, then the cognitive machine becomes engaged and starts to think about, you know, why is it that they think about this, uh, about me in terms of this way. If students ask why they should complete the intervention, you do want to emphasize that they're being asked to complete it because uh, your school wants to hear about their feedback and know more about them, and in particular about the transitions. So we know that transitions are um, moments where meaning making is, is sort of optimal. Uh, and what we're trying to learn is how it is that these students are transitioning into this school at this particular time so that we can better inform what the next generation of students are going to be experiencing so that they're better able to anticipate those challenges. Uh, they, 
this is very unlikely, but because they are randomly assigned to condition, some students might ask, are there different versions of this activity? Uh, and you can say yes, um, but do not say that, that um, any version is more beneficial than the other. Just simply say that because of limited time, um, we're trying to understand as many students' perspectives, so we ask about various aspects of their transition to college. So let me pause there and see if that makes sense. I think I'm actually, yeah. Does that make? Yes, I, but I'm, I'm still waiting to see what we can say that will encourage them to take it or participate in the full capacity. Yeah. Their full attention to it. So I mean, I'm happy to draft um, like a little blurb that maybe I'll send um, send later today that you can, if you want to read out loud, you can, or sort of capture the main element. Um, but essentially, it goes something like this: that that part of uh, you know our our college's efforts to better understand um, our students' experiences comes from being able to engage with students who are going through the transition to college at this time in this college. Um, because those, those experiences will be very different than the experiences that you and I went through uh, at a different school or at a different time. And so we're trying to understand what are some of the experiences, the thoughts, the beliefs, the challenges that they're confronted with so that we can take those insights and uh, share those insights with future students so that those students can better navigate their transition to college. And we always do use this content for the next wave of students. So we, by no means are we deceiving the students. Um, that's exactly how we inform a lot of the interventions that we have um, and recursively improve them year after year. We, we take what we learn from the past version and then we improve on the next version every single time. Um, and that, that's exactly what we do. And then students then see that new enhanced version uh, moving forward. So that's, that's basically the presentation um, in your classes. As I mentioned, just be mindful of how you're uh, framing this activity. The link is self-contained. It'll be distributed to you all. It is ready as of today if, if you wanted to. Um, we, may, we might make slight tweaks throughout the day based on any comments that you might have. Um, but otherwise, I think, I think we're at a good place. And then based on what we learned from there, we will then again take those insights, refine them, and get it ready for the next, uh, next launch, which will be in the, in the, in the fall.